for coming out in the cold weather. Uh, it's not pleasant out there, but I appreciate everybody being here. So I'll go on and do roll call. Kelly Benzman. I'm on the phone, Ernie. Alex Bernke. Here. Chuck Bianca. Here. Michael Denine. Here. Seacrest. Kimberly McCongo. Here. Mandel. Here. Here. Connor. Yeah. Snyder. Ryan Winter. Here. All wise. Here. Um, I, because we did the November meeting virtually, we did not um, stop the meetings from the September meeting. So um, have those on the agenda here too adopt unless anybody has any comments or changes that need to be made to them. Motion to approve the minutes. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Hearing none. <laughs> Who, who's first? I second. And you seconded, Michael? No. Alex did. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have a few updates that we'll go through. So first of all, I wanted to introduce Sarah Fink. Sarah is our newest planner. Um, Sarah comes to us from Franklin County Health Department. Was that right? I'll let you. I'll let you give your little thing. Yeah. Uh, I'm uh, Sarah Fink. Uh, I was most recently at Delaware Public Health District uh, for a brief tenure as the program manager over solid waste and vector. Um, Paul, I got to spray in your township multiple times. You know, township is beautiful at midnight. Um, uh, prior to that, I was at Franklin County Public Health as the community environmental health supervisor and the vector program supervisor. Um, so mosquitoes and ticks are uh, my very strange passion. Um, I'm also the president of the Ohio Mosquito and Vector Control Association, um, but it's uh, exciting to be able to work with this group since we administer the mosquito control grant. Um, in addition to a lot of other um, solid waste programs, uh, a lot of times, you know, solid waste issues are kind of at the heart of some of these vector issues. So I'm excited to be working more on this prevention side of things and, and helping out more um, local health departments and kind of bringing that experience to this group. So um, I'm excited to be here and it's nice to meet all of you. Thrilled to have Sarah with us. So Sarah's overseeing Southwest and part of Southeastern Ohio districts. <clears throat> um, I've Going to give a quick rules update. Michelle is in Florida. Oh, sorry for her. Um, so let me just give you a quick. I'm just going to read this. Uh, so our beneficial use rules we filed with JCAR on November 27th. We're going to have a public hearing on January 5th with the JCAR hearing on January 8th. No testimony was received. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Those have all passed. Planning on establishing a February 11th effective date, which is the earliest possible date after JCAR's jurisdiction ends. For the landfill operational rules, we filed those with JCAR on November 27th. We had a public hearing on January 5th and a JCAR hearing on the 8th. Again, we did not receive any testimony. We're planning on establishing an effective date in April or May to give industry time to prepare for the rule amendments. Our composting rules, uh, we issued an early stakeholder outreach fact sheet. Outreach fact sheet. I was trying to multitask. Sorry. January 12th. The comments, comments are due February 12th. That's for the composting rules. Our solid waste transfer facility rules we filed with JCAR on January 3rd. We're going to have a public hearing on February 7th, and then the JCAR hearing will be on March 4th. The last one is our notary requirement rules. The rules, these rules require a notarized signature that um, we determined is no longer necessary. We filed with JCAR on January 12th. Our public hearing is February 12th, and JCAR meet hearing is March 4th. So Michelle has been busy. So are there any questions, comments about the rules? Okay. Um, Lindsay's going to give us a quick update on the status of our Swiffer grant with US EPA. So Ohio PA is finishing up the processing of our quality assurance project plan, which is called a QAP. Um, once we are approved, we can release our RFP to seek and award a contractor to start the, to the, um, the part one of our Swiffer um, awarded grant, which will conduct the 2024 waste characterization study that will bleed over into 2025. Um, and then we'll continue to work on our part two, which is 
um, working on approving the quality assurance project plan for part two, um, the SWOT analysis and the start of developing the management plan. So progress is coming um, along quite well, and we're looking forward to getting the RFP and a contractor on board to actually hit the ground. And we're um, evaluating kind of like where the landfills and the transfer stations will be across the, the region. Um, we did break it into five different regions across the state, so we'll focus on those five regions. Um, and then we have right now we have about 100 different categories. So. It's exciting work. Um, looking forward to seeing what we have. Lindsay's doing a phenomenal job of managing it. So I can't imagine all the balls she's got up in the air with that. So really appreciate it, Lindsay. Thanks. <clears throat> um, we hear uh, Jeff or Sarah, I'm not sure who was going to give the mosquito control grant update. I'm going to start now. Plus, Sarah. Okay. Great. But yeah, just a little bit about the mosquito control grant program. So Ohio EPA uh, manages a Mosquito Control Grant Program that makes funding available to any entity that implements mosquito control to any government entity. So if you're a government agency, you're eligible for funding. But this resulted from the 2016 Scrap Tire Summit because scrap tires are a major breeding source for mosquitoes. So this is one way to kind of help kind of manage those. So this is a collaborative effort between Ohio EPA and the Ohio Department of Health. So the primary audience for this grant is health departments, but as I mentioned, any government agency can apply. But if you're not a health department, you would have to have the support of your local health department through a uh, letter of support. We do have one solid waste management district that I know of. It's uh, planning on applying this year. So um, um, that's another option. So they can work with their health department to implement those programs. So we kicked off the application November 13th. So we've been accepting applications. We're starting to see this kind of roll in a little bit more now. The deadline to apply is next Friday, January 26th at 3 o'clock PM. So anyone interested still has time to submit an application. And we expect to have a funding decision probably mid to late March that we'll start getting. Then they will have until roughly May of 2024 through April 30th of 2025 to implement those programs. And Sarah, of course, having worked for two different health departments, had received funds from mosquito control grants through both of those health departments. So she's going to give a little bit about some of the things that we had done with funds. Uh, yeah, so from a health department perspective, this grant is really kind of a lifeline to a lot of these programs. Um, you know, unlike septic systems, restaurants, you can't permit uh, or license mosquitoes. So um, for a lot of health departments, this is their only source of funding. Um, for other programs that might have a little more of a developed um, staff or a little more funding, it helps fill in those gaps so that they can really kind of move the needle and look more on prevention instead of just responding to uh, mosquito-borne diseases. Um, just to give some examples on, on um, what I've been able to use grant funds in the past. Uh, at Franklin County Public Health, we would use grant funds to host uh, scrap tire turn-in days um, and also just community cleanups. Um, we would pass out the little dunks that you put in standing water to homeowners. We would partner with Franklin Soil and Water. They'd help pass them out to the people that they gave free rain barrels to. Um, it was really helpful because that was a program outside of our program structure that we wouldn't have been able to implement without these funds. Um, and at Delaware, it was very helpful to pay for some seasonal staff that kind of helped us when we were in a strange uh, in between period this last summer in between buildings. Uh, we also used it to purchase uh, insect repellent wipes that can be distributed at community events. So if um, local municipalities are having um, you know, festivals, movie nights at the parks, we, we can pass those out to their residents. It's available for them. Um, but it, it's a super helpful grant program. Um, one thing that's really nice about it, it doesn't require matching funds, which is very helpful to our, our health departments because a lot of times they don't even have those funds available to to provide those matches. So um, yeah, excited to be on the, the other end of it. And uh, the grant maximum request is up to $25,000 and we have criteria within that. You can uh, apply for different categories, but um, if anyone's interested in that, still have a little over a week to apply. Thank you. 
<clears throat> the last thing on our update is that we are required every year to submit what we call a fee summary report to Ohio's General Assembly. It summarizes all of the financial information that solid waste districts report to us for the year. And um, we are getting ready to submit the 2022 report. We're very behind schedule on this one. Um, so we're going to submit that one. We will get the 2023 report in closer. To, we're actually not allowed to submit it before April. Why that's the case, I don't know. But um, so we will get the 2023 one in, in more on time. Um, that's all we had on our updates, unless people have questions for us at this point. You have, I think everybody, there was a pretty major shift in structure and division. Yes. I spent 30 seconds on sharing that shift. Yeah, so um, they've restructured our program so that rather than our program having five district offices, we're now split in half for the state. So we have a western side and an eastern side. So um, there's the management, there's the management is split so that, Chet, you explain it. <laughs> <laughs> what we have done our restructuring is we've gone away from our five district offices. Uh, prior to this, we've had central district, southeast, southwest, northeast, west district offices. And in those district offices, they had uh, a multitude of personalities. They were our eyes and ears out there as far as facilities and what was going on. Um, what um, in your management, uh, the director uh, in this case has asked that we have all the divisions, and I include not just ours, but all the divisions within the agency, look at restructuring to be more efficient. Uh, and the way that we've determined to be more efficient is to get away from those district offices and to get into more specialized areas. We have an engineering group uh, that covers the state, but east and west. We have a geolo geology uh, section that takes care of, of the state. Um, we have our section, which takes care of all, all the training, all the councils, um, all the communications, uh, grants, you name it, we kind of get all that. There is an enforcement section. Um, Bruce's section has is contains wheel scrap tires and enforcement. Um, and so those are all kind of broken up. The inspectors are still out there uh, doing their inspections, and that falls under uh, two particular managers, both east and west of the state. Um, and so we now have two assistant chiefs, um, and one of our, uh, Joe obviously is one of our assistant chiefs. Uh, but also uh, the other assistant chief is Russ Brown. Uh, he comes from our south uh, southwest district office. Uh, great guy. Uh, he's kind of taking over the inspection side, the engineering side, the geology side of the house um, because that's really his forte. Um, he's going to be managing that side. This is a little bit new. Uh, we have a call tomorrow with Jack and his folks to kind of get an understanding of who they should be reaching out to. So if there is a question in regards to, hey, I used to call so-and-so or talk to so-and-so, but now I, I don't know who I should be talking to. What we've made an effort, all the managers have made an effort, is to bring in the new folks with, I, I don't want to say the old folks, but the folks that kind of dealt with that particular issue in the past and bring them together with our customers and say, this is who we, you should be talking to in regards to this issue and yeah. other issues. So we're trying to do a transition with our customers um, so they clearly understand from their outside perspective who they should be dealing with and who they should be addressing the, those issues to. One thing we, obviously people are always talking to them, I don't want to offend anybody by asking the wrong person or I don't want to get, pushed around from one point to the other. So don't hesitate to ask at any time, who should I be talking to? We're just gonna make a strong effort to ensure that we have more people in the meeting than usual so that the old folks that were dealing with that, <laughs> that issue are all in there at the same time working with you. Or charts that you we can do. share. We do, we will provide that to you. 
Uh, it may be a little bit confusing. You have confused, so. Uh, but we're kind of. Uh, one of the things that our section is doing because we're requesting posting of a couple of positions is we actually did our own work chart, um, which kind of breaks down all the very specific um, responsibilities of each individual within that that section. So that's what the uh, some of our folks have been asking for. Hey, I'm out here. I get questions. I don't know who to go to. I look stupid if I say I don't know. Um, so give me a kind of cheat sheet as to where I should go, who I should send people to. That's what we're trying to create eternally so that everybody understands who they should be directing people to. Is the grant program moved around? Where is it in the big scheme of things? Uh, the grant program is still with EFA. Um, so I assume you're talking about the recycling. Yeah. Yeah, that's still with EFA. So, and it, it's still with the same folks uh, in their real world. And for, for enforcement of facilities, then you'll be butting solid waste districts. Or say that more. So, for the enforcement of facility, you'll be letting solid waste folks know who and where our new contacts will be then for. Yeah, generally, if you, the general rule is for enforcement. If you, I would could still go along with those district offices. So, okay. for instance, if for Cuyahoga County, for Summit, think of the people that you've been dealing with up at Northeast. Okay. Those are generally going to remain the same. They split the state in half. So, Northeast and Southeast are together along with, with Central. Um, so, they're going to be dealing with the same inspectors, same folks that you went to when you were talking about, hey, what is the code or the rule or the policy regarding this type of operation? Primarily management oversight that has changed. Super, thank you. But we'll get you that, that table of organization and if you have questions from there. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Thought it was important that we know that that is, there's a major reshuffle going on. Hopefully it works out well. Um, Ernie's confused all the time. Sorry, Ernie. You're I, yeah, I spend most of my life confused. So, um, I believe we have a legislative, legislative report to approve. I apologize for the late. I totally missed the boat on timing for this meeting, so I sincerely apologize for getting everything out so late. So, I had sent out the 2023 legislative report I think late last week. I hope you <laughs> get to see it. It really isn't all that much different than last year, other than just a few updates. Um, so I got a few typo um, comments, but other than that, I haven't received anything substantial. So if anybody has any comments about it, um, just before before you do, uh, you know, the process has been the past couple of years that Mac has adopted the report and then we send it up to the director's office. And so it's just with the understanding that they may make some minor changes. They didn't make any changes last year. Um, but that's just the way it's been, and then they will forward it on to the general assembly. <laughs> if they made any kind of a major change, I would let you know first. Um, everybody have a chance to at least breeze over it. Any discussion? I get a motion. I move we approve the legislative report. Second. 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 Yeah. All in favor? Aye. All opposed. Anybody abstain? Thank you. Thank you. And I have to thank um Jeff helped me write that this year. So thank you, Jeff. <laughs> so first up on our formal agenda, um, we have Dawn Collins, who's the director of the Portage County Solid Waste District. She's going to provide a little bit of an overview of her district. And also she just recently opened a new charm facility. So she's going to give a little bit of an overview on that. And um just Portage County is a very is is a service oriented um, district, so it's interesting to hear what they have to say. So, Don, Don, are you on? I I am. Can you hear me? Yep. Me. Awesome. Um, Arnie, are you going to? We're just, we're just adjusting our volume. Turn it out. Okay, Don, can you try again? Yes. Yeah, so are, are you are, are you going? going? We have your feedback. slides. Here. You can have. 
we can forward them for you. Oh, OK, yep. let's, let's go ahead. So this is our new and improved charm. A few years ago, um, we had nothing compared to this. We were just a curbside drop off program trying to hit our access rate. Um, so go ahead to the next slide. So Ernie. This is a little bit about where we're located at. We're in northeastern Ohio. We're between Cleveland, Youngstown, and Akron. We have 504 square miles and a population close to 162,000, just to put it into perspective for everyone. Um, we do have three county commissioners and an administrator. We have, we have a staff of 10. It makes it pretty difficult to run all those curbside routes and the drop-offs and to have a charm facility. So. Um, Hopefully we'll, we'll add more soon, but we wanted to see how um, the charm facility would actually work, right? We, we had no idea if it would be popular, but based upon the phone calls, we had a feeling how it would turn out. Would turn out. So with the help of all of the private haulers in the area, we are able to hit an access rate of 92% for curbside recycling, or I, sh I shouldn't say curbside, but for for single stream recycling and the drop offs were able to hit an access rate of 92%. An actual photo of where I'm located at. The left side is um, our service garage where we house all of our curbside trucks and our drop off trucks. Uh, the middle building is a nice picture of our administrative offices, and the right side is our facility that houses our charm facility and our new addition to our HHW, which we'll talk about in just a second. We do have a active transfer station license. You can see in that picture, we do have a railway that runs right behind us. And there is not an, a um, landfill in Portage County. So we're really kind of unique in that, in that aspect. Two years ago, I took over the district, but um, we started doing all of these renovations. Most of them were done in-house. If you look at the top right photo, this is what we, we really looked like. We looked like we accepted a bunch of garbage and that's what we were receiving in our dumpsters. Just um, our contamination rate was, was awful. And so we started updating our, our dumpsters and made them look like they they belonged for recycling. So below that top right picture is is what they ended up looking like. Um, you can see the staff all working on all of them. And we actually wanted to really change our image and what we promoted to the to the public. Um, I mentioned we have seven drop off locations. Our biggest drop off location is here at the district. Even though the community here has curbside recycling, I have to say it is such a a big drop off with the curbside recycling here. And with the curbside here, we offer many more options at this drop off. Um, and in, inside this drop off, we offer our plastic bag, we offer scrap metal, we offer um, United States flag retirement, we offer oil, we offer, um, I think we'll get to better pictures of it, but food composting, yard composting, and it really all started with phone calls. I, I, I couldn't handle the phone calls anymore. And I'm like, how can I stop these phone calls from coming in? And in order to do that, we we had to take action. So that, that's what we began to do. And a lot of these um, containers were were made in house, and they were made with a cricket. So it's it was really my staff that that did this. Um, this is a better, new, improved picture of the drop off. It used to be a pretty old, rust colored, and once we made the improvements, this is what it ended up looking like. This is what we pass out to the public and this is the programs we offer at the actual drop off itself. So this is what you can bring, not the charm, not the HHW, but this is outside of our drop off here in Broomfield. 
This is just really, really a cool program that we started. And a, a big program is what do I do with um, United States flags? And this program has been a really big hit. And I have a driver that is a Cub Scout master. And as you can see, it it is really a, a good program. Food compost, you know, listening to the amount that goes into the landfill and all the harm that it's doing, I thought it was a, a big program to start. The company that showed up at my door, uh, it, it's called Rubber City Reuse, and I was really frustrated because I didn't understand. I'm like, are we going to recycle rubber? Like, it, it made no sense to me, but this company has been fantastic. They swap out 95-gallon um, carts. Every week, there's no smell associated with it. If if there's food, it goes to a. If there's meat, it goes to a separate, a separate place. Um, if it's pumpkins or something, it, it's easy. Um, we are able to take the pumpkins. We're able to take a lot of different items now. So anybody in the public, we let businesses come here, and um, again, this was all done in house. Yard waste. We had a bunch of storms this year, and a lot of our communities have no curbside pickup. There's no place to drop it, especially when COVID hit. A lot of places closed, and I'm like, what are we going to do? I started calling around, and I found a company. Um, it's about a mile down the road for us, and we have our own, uh, our own drop-off or our own um, roll-off, so we are able to take our 40 yards fill them and then take it a mile down the road, pay $400 a year and as many loads as I need to take. And as long as I keep it clean, um, we're able to take Christmas trees, we're able to take um, leaves and logs and branches and sticks and twigs. Like it has this program, I think on the next slide or the next one, it will tell you the exact tonnage to date, almost, almost for the year. Uh, we didn't implement that until after a really big storm in, in March of last year, but it, it is crazy how the programs just took off. Um, the charm facility, we actually, um, like I said, we pick up a lot of curbside communities. We lost our biggest city to a private hauler who ended up doing trash and recycling. And um, once we did that, we were able to focus more on the term facility and getting it ready to open. And once we were able to do that, we launched a, a date of September 18th. And so we were able to certify a few of our drivers to remove the um, Freon. And, and so now we'll take refrigerators, we'll take freezers, we'll take um. Um, we take plastic bags for the trucks program. We take transmission fluid. We take tires. We did receive that EPA grant for forty thousand, and um, we we charge fifty cents a tire, but it keeps them out of the ditches. And I'll show you a pretty cool video in a second. But once we added the charm facility, I still feel like it wasn't enough because the phone calls just keep coming. And it's really, well, what do I do with this cleaner? Or what do I do with this chemical? Or what do I do with this pesticide? And I really didn't have any answers. And my answer is, well, it's residential waste. We could put it in the trash or you could wait until one day. Maybe I will hopefully have a cleanup for you. And we did have one over the 12 years that I was here, but we really didn't have any cleanups. Um, and now we were able to put together this program that is um, the first Monday of every month. It is um, two to six. It runs concurrent with our charm facility. So with the charm facility, they will hit our employees first. And then if it is not hazardous waste, we will take it and handle it. And then if it is hazardous waste, you can see the big box truck in that photo then they will go to clean earth if it is hazardous waste. Um, you can see by the line of the cars in the bottom photo there that the line is is pretty good, but it's not as expensive as I imagined it would be. And um, it has been a really, really good success for, for Portage County. We held our first farm tire collection program last week. Um, we did 
have our residents pre-register for this. I wasn't sure how we were going to handle that. We've never been able to do that in Portage County before. Um, we scheduled half hour increments because those tires are, are really big. They're taller than us. And um, we filled two 40 yard dumpsters. We will continue to take those until we hit the grant amount, and then we'll make some choices on what we'd like to do with that. But we haul those tires to Minerva, to Liberty Tire, and um, we hope to be able to continue these programs. These are education and our outreach, how we tell people about our programs. We sit at the Portage County Fair all week long. We have a really cool recycling truck that pretends like it's picking up curbside recycling. We go to Kent State, we do touch of trucks, we host touch of trucks, and we bring Boy Scout troops in and we show them what, we, what we're all about. Last week, we were able to, like I said, partner with Trex and give two Trex benches to one of our local schools. These are the partners that, that we do work with. The electronics, which I think I did not mention in, in the charm facility, um, we had nowhere to take televisions. We were sending them two counties away to Stark County. We were having them pay $20 two years ago. Um, they are paying $20, but they're able to bring them to Portage County now, along with all of the other electronics. Um, we do take the waste oil. We take cooking oil. Um, the food and the Freon and um, any type of scrap metal. A lot of people won't put it at their curb or there's not enough to put it at their curb for, their, for scrappers to come by and take, but everybody when they bring their, their curbside or their drop off, they, they will bring it here and they fill my scrap metal super fast. We have to empty it almost daily, which is, which is an added um, revenue for us. You will see our single stream collection and how much we actually take to waste management to have processed there. And we also collect latex paint, which diverts from the cost of our household hazardous waste costs. And we collect 25,000 pounds of latex paint this year, last year now. But that's a huge amount. It's remade into product and it's sold at um, the Habitat Resource, um, especially in Portage County. Um, and then there's a nice cute little YouTube video that one of my drivers made. Lindsay said it worked. <laughs> we're waiting i just have to say that in dawn's two-year tenure here she has made just incredible changes to her district she she inherited a big problem and she has really turned it around so uh, dawn it's been great to work with you and hear everything you've been doing so thank you Ernie. it's thinking about it <laughs> YouTube's always funny. that motivational music earning. It's not one to come through here, but we will put them in the chat so I can see it. 
this is finishing up. Does anybody have any questions for Don? I, I did forget to mention we offer residential document shredding. It goes straight into our baler so we can bail that material. And then once we have enough, we can sell it. So we do have quite a few revenue streams in, in regards to the charm. It's not all a cost. It's helpful. Don, hi, uh, Kimberly McConville here with Ohio Beverage Association. Um, really impressive uh, program presentation. I'm just curious, um, how how do you work with the private sector on curbside? Um, and and kind of what I'm driving at is, it sounds like you have done amazing things with drop off, creating charm. Um, are are you comfortable running that side of the house? and letting the private sector do curbside. Just curious about your feelings as much as you can sort of characterize how you see that interplay. Yeah, um, that's a good question. So typically the curbside that we run, the private hauler doesn't want access to because those areas don't have a single hauler for the trash. So we pick up the townships that are non-subscription so everybody has it um but there's not just one trash hauler there so there's a lot I, I i think that's that's pretty confusing so there's lots of trash haulers but just one recycling provider Does that makes sense know that it makes policy sense, but I understand that's reality, you know, in a lot of parts. <laughs> right, so a lot of a lot of trash haulers are there. The townships have not passed for just one trash hauler to be there. So the rates could be all over the place. Um, so therefore, a trash hauler does not necessarily want to pick up the curbside recycling there. Um, and, and they don't pick up the curbside recycling there. Um, so we do pick up the curbside recycling there and we have standardized our rates. So it's the same car, the same cost across the board um, for the communities that we pick up. Those are individual homes or is that just a local drop off area? Um, it, it would be both. So we pick up, I think, about 20,000 homes. We run a lot of curbside routes. So a lot of, uh, um, I think there's only one other one in the state of Ohio that picks up a solid waste district that picks up curbside like we do. And I think their population is like 20,000 total, but we pick up about 20,000 homes. Other questions? Um, hi, Don, this is uh, um, What is the class two uh, facility that Rubber City Compost is utilizing. Is it their own or are they taking that material to another class two? Um, it is earth and wood in Stark County. Don, do you have user fees for those 20,000 stops you have to make a week or whenever? I do, yes. I, it is $5.50 a month every other week service enough to fund that operation that's correct yep those recycling trucks are about four hundred and twenty five thousand a piece um if we don't have any other questions i'll ask one more and that's because it kind of comes out of this group have you looked at any of the recycling partnership contamination reduction stuff have you utilized any of that information that's been put together or look forward to utilizing any of the stuff on the next program? Yes, uh, I, I have looked at all of that. Um, and we were able to drop our contamination rate from over 20% to 9%. And we eliminated our contamination fee, the excessive fee. So, so we are much better now. Thank you. Thank you so much, Don, for joining us and presenting. It's always good to see you. Yeah, thank you. I'm excited to come see the facility. I'm ready. So in conjunction with Dawn's presentation, um, we have 
EPA and Eswato have been working on a household hazardous waste project of together. And um, we have Brad Petrie, who is with Miami County Solid Waste District, who's kind of going to give an overview of a survey that that we're intending to to distribute to get more information. So, Brad, are you are you available? Available? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Sure. So, no, it's just uh, my, well, my name is Brad Petrie. I'm the, the 2024 president of Eswato. Um, and I, we've been kind of back and forth on some emails to um, Ohio EPA. And we're working on trying to create a survey through the um, Division of Waste and Material Waste or the DIMWIM um, so that we can reach out and try to, to get a, a concept of how, who all has facilities, what, how household hazardous waste is kind of being handled district by district. Um, with the, the big goal being having um, some sort of a master document that people could go and refer to to be able to, to work on contracts to, to get a little bit better uniform pricing, um, maybe look at, at big picture things as far as, you know, maybe there'd be a state contract that people could go to that they could reference to be able to get a better rate for their, their household hazardous waste uh, processing, disposal, recycling, whatever that would look like. Um, we're working on trying to roll that out for the February meeting, which will be the second, I believe, um, and try to get some of these surveys from all the different Eswato members. Um, or that, that's just a 30,000 foot view of that. Ernie, is there something that you can see that I'm missing that we've had in some of these conversations? Um, Brad, I've only Brad, been... I've only been uh oh. Did I lose you? Hold no, on just a moment. Um, um, so Brad, so Brad, uh, uh, somebody's got a microphone on. Microphone on. Sure. Um, anyhow, Brad. Um, anyhow, so Brad, I've only so been tangential. I'll, I'll, I'll let Lindsay. Sure. Or Sarah kind of. Sarah kind of. And Brad, I'm going to read you the feedback. So. Okay. That works, thanks. Um, yeah, so the survey, as Brad mentioned, is looking, kind of getting a, a better detailed inventory about what exactly, um, what household hazardous waste items each solid waste district accepts. Do they take a fee for them? Um, do they have a permanent facility? Is it a part-time collection event? Um, also asking, you know, what are those beard questions at a left field are you getting? What's that next thing that people are like, I don't know what to do with this, but I want to throw this out uh, or dispose or recycle of it. Um, the other aspect of this survey that will also help, in addition to what Brad mentioned, um, the benefit of the solid waste districts, um, on our end, it's very helpful to get this information as all these uh, federal grant dollars continue to roll out with the um, Inflation Reduction Act. Um, Kind of knowing what is existing already and what those gaps are to getting more of these um, like charms implemented or increasing this infrastructure. Um, it's just, yeah very vital for us to kind of have this information as we're applying for these grants um, so that we know what our solid waste districts actually need and, and what they need help with um, to keep moving their their programs along. And and also this information, you know, we're we're starting to talk about the state plan. This information may be useful for our discussions too. We'll just have to see. And you know, Aswato. I'm sorry, Aswato is doing a lot of really good partnering with with us right now. And so um, they're also going to be. We had mentioned doing a subcommittee for working on the the state plan. And Brad and Jen both have graciously agreed to be on that committee. So we'll be working a lot closer with the SWATO this time than we have in the past. So we really appreciate that effort. Jen, do you have anything you. to add? Brad? Brad does. Brad. No, I, all I was going to say is, yeah, for, from a, an Aswato standpoint, we really want to have that that information sharing kind of at our fingertips to where we're able to, again, just to kind of work together. Um, you know, there, there's been things discovered just in, in the conversations kind of leading up to this that districts that were neighboring that didn't have, you know, a, a, know what the other one was doing and didn't even realize they were using the same vendor. So there's there's just having that communication out there, I think, is going to be, you know, vital for solid waste districts as a whole and, and where the vested interest from Aswato comes in on this. Hey Brad, um, members, do you have any questions for Brad? When do you expect to roll this out? 
February. Uh, it's our intention to have, we want to have it out after the meeting. We want to present it during our squad meeting on February 2nd. Um, hope we have it out in the afternoon. Try to give a, a two week turnaround. I mean, a week, two week turnaround to get that that information submitted back, you know, through the survey. And the, the neat thing, and Sarah might be able to speak more to this, um, we're hoping to have a, a live, um, a, as you submit your results, uh, we're hoping to have that live. So you're able to, each individual district is able to see this, the who's responding to what and when and how. Um, yeah, I don't know if y'all have taken surveys and you're like, I'm really curious to see what everyone else is answering. Uh, Microsoft Forms allows us to have a link uh, where you can view the results live. Um, and we're, we're hoping this encourages more people to um, contribute to the survey as well so that they can actively see what other people are answering. Because I know when I was at the local level, I was always curious, but you know, you know what your neighbors are doing, but maybe the people two counties over, you have no idea what's going on. So um, yeah, we're, we're hoping that's a, a beneficial feature that helps everyone out and increases participation. Beth, did you have a question? Um, I guess maybe just some food for thought this and finally bring this up because this is kind of ancient history and I don't know if anybody remembers this but um, you know 25 years ago there was a consortium for household hazardous waste back in the days when everybody primarily did you know twice a year roundup kind of things and the, the pricing was very good um, you know what we encountered in northeast Ohio um, because we were able to you know pull together such volumes um, scheduling took a bit of an effort because that in that time frame, everybody still did, as I said, these drop offs. But, you know, a, a consortium consideration, even if you run a permanent, might be something that would be helpful. You know, you could have a consortium of, you know, kind of permanently run facilities just to um, aggregate those kinds of volumes if you could come up with an agreed upon list of materials. So, I've been around I've long been enough around that I. All I was going to add to that is I think that, that by being able to get all this information in one place, I think it's going to open the door for a lot of different opportunities for Oswato Ohio EPA to look at to, to be able to, to get, um, you know, to leverage the, the networks of people that are, are, are already doing the program. You know, I, I think that, that that's certainly a, a consideration and, and uh, we're just working our way through it, trying to get the data first to, to figure out how we can move forward. But thank you. Has there ever been a, and please excuse my ignorance, I thought that there was a program that government entities, there could be a, ma a mass contract or a mass bid from a state perspective, and then you didn't have to bid it out each time. It was all kind of like a pre-approved program through Department of Administrative Services, maybe. maybe. Is that something Is that's that ever been looked at been before? Looked at before? Not for household hazards. Household hazards, hazards, hazards with. Uh, I mean, there are I mean, state there contracts, are state contracts and trucks and things of that nature that any government agency, including solid waste districts, could participate in, right. to your point, and not have to bid. But that's never been done for household hazards waste of any kind. We had kind of these more regional uh, consortiums eons ago. And to that point, you know, it was a group that drove the price down. So something, something I, that, I, that, that could be a possibility. The mechanism, the mechanism exists, exists. We just haven't used it for, for household hazardous waste, correct? We do have a cloud agreement with DAS, and I think it's for retrack, so that we have, anybody can get into a contract with retrack using the pricing that we get. <laughs> and actually, that was Generally, one of the things state that we're just going to do it. Once the state Once government does something, then the locals can benefit from that price. Generally, it's for stuff, not collections. So. I didn't know if there was an option to do that for services or not. It's kind of an interesting. I mean, it might not be normal, but. Yeah, I, I don't know the answer to that. It might be beneficial. Yeah. yeah. Brad, you were, you were going to add. <laughs> no, actually, he, he, he took the words right from me. I, I think that we were. We're, it, it's not been done. We don't know what we can do, but I think that the, the first step for this was just the information grab and, and who's doing what, where, and, and how can we benefit from that and how can we add to that and complement it. If there's no other questions, Brad, thank you for, for giving us an update on that. And again, we do appreciate all the collaboration that you and that you're starting to initiate with us. 
it's our pleasure. Thanks for having us. Uh, next on the agenda, we have our standing um, recycling and litter prevention grant update. So we have April online who's going to give us uh, just an update as where things stand. April. Hey, thanks everybody. Sorry, am I connected there? I almost I almost came in and saw you all in person, but I chickened out with the uh, the cold, so I apologize. <laughs> One second, let me bring up my PowerPoint here. Is that good? We can see it. Okay, perfect. Okay, so just a brief update, uh, just a few uh, minutes. The um, the grant closed on, um, or the application period closed on December 1st. Hmm. Uh, this year we did move um, the, the timeline up a little bit. Um, the main concern we had with that, again, I know we've, we've talked about this at, at other meetings, was um, us butting up to the, the fiscal year and being able to get the, the disbursements out in a timely manner um, and without uh, fiscal yelling at us and also, you know, make the money available earlier in the, the year um, for events and, and things that would happen prior to July 1st. So again, we closed um, the application on December 1st and, and this is what we received. Um, this is, I think, one less total number of grants that we've ever gotten, but significantly more and asks than we've ever gotten um, so close to that that $10 million mark. Um, uh, but as you can see, the, um, the source reduction is what we're calling the water bottle refilling stations um, grant. We're looking to potentially expand that to some other source reduction um, type activities in the future. So we kind of renamed that um, source reduction for, for now, but those 62 projects are all water bottle refilling stations. Again, we opened that up to um, local governments and nonprofits this year, so we did get some applications um, for more than just schools. Uh, there, so we're excited to see that. Uh, we did get significantly more market development grants than we've ever gotten, um, or at least in you know in recent history. So we're very excited about that. Um, we have had to um, withdraw since the application period, and we had a third that was um, ineligible. Um, so we actually have 18 um, that we're reviewing and scoring. Um, we did just get those scored um, in the last week. Um, so our next steps then are to. Um, kind of decide what our recommendations are based on, you know, how the scoring shakes out and then start doing our administrative and compliance checks. So we'll be doing those in the next month and hoping to meet with the director um, that last week of February, worst case, first week of March um, to present our recommendations for the, the grant program and then uh, make those announcements um, hopefully in early March. And, and again, the project um, period starts April 1st this year. Um, so uh, funding wise, um, we we did get um, an increase in our spending authority from the recycling and litter prevention fund. Our spending authority is eight and a half million per year, but we do have a good chunk of that that comes out for administrative costs for um, salaries and, and and fees and things like that. Um, a very conservative estimate is that we'll have um, seven million dollars to to use from that. Uh, we may go a little over that. We've also got some other projects that we might want to fund out of that other than, than the regular grant cycle. So being very conservative, we will fund at least $7 million out of that fund um, of those grants. And then the, the scrap tire, we do have a million separate for that. Um, so we're looking to to probably be around $8 million. Again, we haven't, um, we haven't figured out, you know, who's going to get funded yet and, and done all that, but that's what we kind of anticipate. So, so we are still $2 million over, so we will have to make some cuts. Um, on that, but that's kind of what we're looking at as far as funding for 2024. Um, so that's the grant program. And then just briefly, I wanted to mention we are working to update the recycling directory. Uh, we do have on our website a, a directory that you know people can search um, to find places to recycle. Um, things or, or to dispose of things. Um, those of you in the solid waste management districts or those of you that may have listings on the recycling directory, you may have been hearing from us already. We've been um, sending out some forms to um, to those that have listings and asking them to be, to update those. Um, and we're going to be um, kind of diving deeper and making sure that all those listings are up to date. We added um, boat wrap, um, boat shrink wrap as a, a category recently, the um, there's a work group of uh, marinas um, working with the clean marinas program um, that is is trying to increase um, shrink wrap recycling. So we added that as a listing and they're going to so they're going to start adding um, their locations of where they're taking that. So that's that's kind of cool. Um, 
and we're hoping to to utilize the recycling directory for um, enhanced household hazardous waste um, information as well. Um, so very happy to see that um, solid waste management districts are looking at the charm facilities. We would love to help support those um, through the grant program because we do have a you know a focus on trying to to better um, have better outlets for that household hazardous waste. So we're kind of looking at that and being able to use the recycling directory for that. Um, and then just the last thing I wanted to mention is we are um, taking applications for the Encouraging Environmental Excellence Award Program uh, for 24. We take those up through April 30th and um, we are hosting a webinar next week to talk about how to apply for that. So um, if you can help us spread the word with that um, to organizations in your areas that uh, may be doing some really cool things, we'd love to um, to get a bunch of um, applica applications this year. Last year we had our biggest class. I think we had 47, 48 um, awardees and we're hoping to do the same this year. Um, we can drop that um, link to the webinar um, in the chat for everyone. So that's all I had. And then of course, as usual, the the, uh, the little grant team there, uh, me, Marie or uh, Carrie, feel free to reach out if you have any grant related questions or anything. members do you have any questions for april thanks april no problem good to see you all uh, so next up on our agenda um, we have matt dobson who is president of the vital siting institute he's going to give us an introduction to a project that they worked on um, for recycling vinyl siting in northeast ohio matt thank you did I say, I said, Mike, I have you wrong on the agenda. I sincerely apologize for that. I had you down as Mike. Um, we appreciate you joining us today to give us an overview of your program. Great. Well, good to be here. Um, let me first, I don't know if I'm on the screen or how I'm on the screen. I do have a presentation I brought up. And is that being seen? <laughs> Can you all hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yes, okay. we can see it. And you can you can see my presentation as well as. Uh, yep, it's up on our screen. OK, perfect. Well, great. Good to be with you all. I am uh, Matt Dobson. With the Vinyl Siding Institute, um, vice president um, and also the lead staff person um, with the management of our Revinalized Recycling Collaborative. So we are uh, happy to be here today and do appreciate the invitation. Um, this is a program that has been in the works for a couple of years. It ties directly into Ohio as we have had a pilot program going on in Northeast Ohio for the last couple of years to determine how we can divert product from the landfill and put it back into new rigid vinyl products, rigid vinyl building materials. So um, I'll give a little bit of background on the program. Uh, we did a little bit uh, on uh, recycling as an issue, um, and then I'll talk about our findings uh, from the pilot program and the progress that we made there up in Northeast Ohio, mainly in Cuyahoga County, Ohio, and uh, where we're going, and then hopefully um, where we can get involvement and help from you all uh, as uh, municipalities and part of government um, and really as a partnership. Uh, we've set up the program in a way that we identified which uh, stakeholders are really important to the success of this program. And of course, uh, part of that success comes uh, working in partnership with uh, local governments and even state governments for that matter. Um, and so with that, um, let me give you a little more background and uh, please uh, jump in at any point uh, with any questions. Um, so who we, who are we? We're the Vinyl Siding Institute. We're the trade association for the manufacturers of vinyl polymeric siding. Um, vinyl siding was actually invented in Ohio in Columbus. Uh, Crane Plastics uh, it was was a, one of the inventors. Uh, in fact, they have a, a die in one of their meeting rooms there in Columbus uh, that's dated 1956. I meant to show show that up on the screen, but I didn't have a chance to update my update my presentations. But mm -hmm. Columbus is basically the starting point for vinyl siding. So it's uh, and we have strong manufacturing in vinyl uh, in in Ohio. Uh, you know whether it be uh, Westlake, 
uh, or uh, we have Alcoa Applied Gem. We have uh, All Side up in Cleveland. We have uh, Stylecrest over near Toledo. Um, so we have lots of manufacturing there. And uh, this is the best place to start for this program. Um, part of Revinylize includes a certification process, which certifies that the recyclers in the program have the ability to recycle post-consumer vinyl products. So we're not focused, and I, I assume most of those in the room are very familiar with recycling. For those that aren't, you know, post-consumer is where you get one business that has a bunch of scrap and they sell it to another business and then they put it into another product. That that actual process for recycling is very mature and, um, and uh, you know, takes care of itself. Our program is actually focused on post-consumer recycling and that means that it's either gone to the distributor, it's been put up on a house, it's been scrapped from a new construction site. So it's the consumer has already done their consuming of the product, so to say, and now it's being put, put back into new products. And so the Green Circle certification component, which is a group called Sustainable Solutions, they do a lot of certification for different sustainability programs. They're certifying the recyclers have the ability to collect the product to collect post-consumer product. And so... The vision of Revinylize is to make it as easy as possible to recycle vinyl material. Uh, and we're creating an organization and connections between the stakeholders um, as part of this waste disposal process. And you know, I, I hate to use all these terms, waste disposal, you know, diversion and collection sites versus dumpster and disposal, landfills now become, you know, you know, sorting, you know, sorting uh, sites. Um, so you know, a lot of the transformation of what we're trying to accomplish here, you know, actually comes in the use of the language too, and and stop talking about landfills and talk. We talk about diversion, so a lot of it is the communications part of it, um, and I'll talk about that a little bit more. Some of the research that we had done actually, um, you know, it doesn't seem as intuitive as putting a a uh, you know a can in a, in a blue bin. Um, so we did some research. Um, and really started to learn not just from the pilot program I mentioned, but also through uh, significant research we did about a year and a half ago. Um, you know, we have to create a strong understanding that vinyl products are thermal plastic products. So th they're able to, you're able to basically grind them down, remelt them, and really put them back into new products. In fact, they can be, you know, vinyl siding can be ground up and put into new vinyl siding, um, you know, uh, deck boards, any of the rigid vinyl materials. Um, can be reground and put into new rigid materials. The innovation that has come along with the, the production and manufacturing of vinyl siding or deck boards, you know, like vinyl deck boards, which you see a lot of now, it involves a co-extrusion process. So you, you have product that's very specifically formulated for vinyl siding. The top layer is very specifically formulated, but the bottom layer, it can be very easily uh, used for recycled product. They're, they're, they're a great Things that can be done with recycled materials because of the innovation that so the so vinyl siding is co-extruded, deck boards are co-extruded to a certain extent. You know, you have a cap on the outside of deck boards. The inside of that product, you know, can be recycled products. So, um, you know, and and there are some misconceptions about the recycling of vinyl in general. You know that you know there's not there's not a way to do that. That the you know that there's a toxic issue with this vinyl in its final form is is extremely stable and it, it's it poses no toxic risks whatsoever in the recycling process the 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 um the emissions of the product that do create some toxic risks is well before this uh, when they're actually making the vinyl resin from natural gas and salt. So I don't know how many people in the room know, but vinyl siding comes from salt, its main ingredient, and then natural gas is its second ingredient. So during that process, when they're actually forming, uh, you know, the vinyl resin, that's where you have some toxic issues. But of course, all that, all that type of process, you know, was uh, really addressed very well in the Clean Air Act, you know, back in the 70s and 80s. So there's what we're talking about in recycling that has to do with basically you just take that product you just bash it up you know, pulverize it into a form uh, into a small enough form that it can be remelted and put into new products so you're really just talking about a heat process at that point so there's there's not there's not any toxic risk you know with recycling specifically um so 
And it's important we continue to communicate that because there is a lot of misinformation. There's even people out there who say, well, vinyl is not even recyclable. And, you know, nothing could be further from the truth um, than that. So communication is really important in the, in the research that we also uh, took took uh, took into account input from the building and design pros, homeowners and municipalities. Um, you know how how we how we continue to educate on this, that, you know, there there is an opportunity, an economic opportunity to recycle, um, that there's a, an, an opportunity to reduce our carbon footprint through recycling. And why is that? That is because the recycling process is significantly less energy intensive than the virgin manufacturing process. So, you know, recycling is good because we're, we're kind of shrinking that circular approach here. We're taking out the, the, uh, you know, the virgin material, to, you know, it's not, you know, we're never going to have completely recycled product because there's just not enough quantity out there. But the more that we can use recycled quantities, the more that we can reduce our carbon footprint. Carbon footprint is directly related to, you know, some of the things that come along with climate change and whatnot. So there is an opportunity to, to use uh, recycling as a tool, not only to divert stuff from the landfill, which, you know, it's just good from, you know, an intuitive sense, but it's also a, a, an opportunity to reduce our carbon footprint, um, which is great. So, you know, communication and education is key. Again, partnerships really important here, and that's why we're here today to really ask you all to help us with our mission and our vision. Um, I've mentioned here uh, our 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 mission, our mission and vision. You know, we basically are trying to make it as easy as possible. So, in some of our learnings that I'm going to go through next, um, you'll see why that's important. Um, but it, 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 this collaborative is does involve the recyclers, of course, the collection sites. And the collection fight sites come in different forms and shapes and forms, um, but also advocacy for the program, um, you know, that local governments and even the state governments. I know I'm, I, I live in North Carolina. We have a, our state EPA actually has a whole recycling program that is helping to communicate out what our program is doing. So communication and publicity of the program will only help to drive the success of this program even more. And that's what we're looking for in some cases. Now, in some cases, I do think that local municipalities can also act as collection sites. Um, and we're working with some, with some recyclers in Maryland right now where they're having challenges. We're getting uh, you know, local municipalities maybe have co recycling collection points and and we need to create awareness that this can be done. Here's the recyclers that are available in your area. Can we set up collection uh, collection bins, you know, at your municipal recycling locations? And um, so there's there's a lot to be done here uh, to create the most success possible with this program. Let me just touch on about on the pilot program before I, I get into the success and how the program is formally set up now. Um, so, as I indicated, we um, had a program called the Northeast Ohio Recycling Coalition that started a couple of years ago. And some of the things that we learned are there there is very minimal, if little, post-consumer infrastructure. So that infrastructure is missing, and that infrastructure is different than your post-industrial infrastructure. Post and, and obviously, it's it's harder. It's it's you know you're you're talking about setting up collection bins and then collecting material that may be dirty and whatnot, whereas the post-industrial side is perfect because it's a bunch of clean materials like buying resin, you know, you know, you're just buying material that needs to be ground up again. You don't have to worry about where it's coming from. So that that infrastructure is definitely missing. Um, collection sites will come in different forms. They will come as a distributor, like an all side or an ABC supply. You know, they can act as a collection site. Um, but the biggest, you know, the biggest thing we learned is construction, demolition, landfills, you know, that's where the product is going so much. Um, and that's where, you know, with the with the landfills, you know, they're charging a tipping fee. But if they can spend a little bit of time sorting the products at the landfill, or as I like to call it, as this mass collection sorting site, and that's that's what they could become more so then they then the recyclers will actually pay them for that product so before they're getting they're getting a dumpster full of load of construction materials and it just goes in a landfill and you know you know what that's that's it that's their economic model now if we can get these landfills to act as these diversion and, and sorting points now they have another economic incentive now the, the one issue with the economic issue incentive issue is that as the price of resin goes up the price, you know, the opportunity for recycling becomes more attractive as the price of resin goes down. 
you know, then recycling becomes less attractive. So there's just like any free markets out there, there will be some ebbs and flow as the price of, uh, you know, of natural gas goes up and down or whatever else impacts resin, you know, that, that can impact recycling a little bit, but um, you know, so, but the more collection sites that we have, the better, the more frequency we have, the better that drives an economic model because if you have a couple of collection sites, 50 miles apart, obviously the transportation costs go up, go up and, and a significant amount of the cost of recycling has to do with the transportation. But if you have a bunch of different collection sites, you know, a mile apart or two miles apart, and you got 10 or 15 within a 10 mile radius, that makes it much more econo economically feasible for the recyclers. And so the more collection sites that we can have in place, the higher the frequency, um, not only does it help the recyclers, but let's face it, consumers are going to, are hesitant. I'm not, I don't know if I want to drive to my next town over just to bring a couple hundred pounds of recycled product. You know, I want to, I want to be able to, you know, drive five minutes away. And so the higher frequency, the different types of models, distribution centers, C and D landfills, um, municipal, municipalities, um, those can all be collection sites. And we may come up with some other really, um, you know, r really unexpected collection sites. Who, who knows what that may be? But the biggest one that we learned in the, in the pilot program was the C&D landfills. And so that's a big focus point for us moving forward is trying to bring the C&D the landfills more into the mix. Um, we, we know the timing here is very good. I mentioned that vinyl siding was invented in Columbus you know, back in the 50s. Um, well, those first and second generations of vinyl siding are really coming, in some cases, coming to end, end of useful life. And why does that matter? Well, 15 years ago, most of the vinyl siding was not, you know, coming to end of useful life. Um, now that we're 50 and 60 years from some of that initial, initial phases of vinyl siding, that vinyl siding is being replaced, hopefully with new vinyl siding. But my point is, is that on the remodeling side, that's where our biggest opportunity is for quantities. For a remodeled house, you're getting about two to 3,000 pounds of vinyl siding available to be recycled. Um, for new construction, you're looking at maybe two or 300 pounds. And so for new construction, which has been booming, great. You know, we want to take that scrap. But when you got a couple hundred pounds of product versus remodeling, where you got a couple thousand pounds of product to be recycled, obviously it makes it much more attractive for the recyclers to be able to collect that substantial amount of material versus trying to figure out how we can really, uh, you know, how, work with the whole, new home builders to, to get that product, even though it's less quantity, still get it recycled. So, you know, there's challenges when it comes to that, but the point is, is that the opportunity in this day and age being, you know, so far from the, the original point of vinyl siding being invented uh, cr creates an opportunity for us because there's going to be product uh, available for recycling. Um, I mentioned about frequency. Um, you know, the communication is very important. Um, you know, there's a lot of naysayers out there in the environmental front, um, and especially when it comes to plastics. And, um, and so for us to communicate, create education, and understanding, you know, for those that have heard that vinyl cannot be recycled well if they're involved with it you know they're just going to discard it just the way it's been done the more awareness more communication we create about how vinyl can be recycled the more success we'll have with the program and um, the, the final thing i'll say in the learning is that we have vinyl siding we have pipe we have deck boards, we have windows, we have deck and rail. Those, that's all rigid building materials that can be recycled together. And um, so we don't have to, and if we can leverage the different, these different segments, and main, the, the biggest difference is if you look at how pipe is used, you know, and I'm talking about municipal pipe, I'm talking about uh, plumbing in houses and building pipe, um, you know, those are totally different businesses than the vinyl siding and window and deck and rail business. Those those businesses are a little more interconnected, whereas pipe is not. So we are happy to say that the uh, Plastic Pipe and uh, Fitting Association, uh, Unibel, has partnered with us on this uh, on this uh, collaboration uh, so that we can start to leverage the, mo the uh, distribution models that are different in pipe versus siding. And so by creating more frequency and then also creating this wider net of rigid products, you know, we think we've given our chance, uh, given ourselves the best chance for success here. Um, so um, final, final, final just report here on the, on the, um, on the pilot itself. 
Um, you know, we went from 41,000 pounds to 84,000 pounds uh, to 2023. We're still collecting the final numbers, but we'll be well over 400,000 pounds that we have impacted as part of this effort. And so we know we can, we, you know, we, we know we've made a difference in Northeast Ohio. So now that's why we want to take the program nationally. Um, and I think I've hit on the other points in this slide. And certainly the slide has been made available to you all. So let me just land here on this final uh, final slide. And, you know, this is really uh, where we'd love to get you all involved, um, whatever your role is. Um, I don't know the complete makeup of the group I'm speaking to, but uh, there is a place for everyone in this movement, um, you know, and it's important that uh, we get these different membership categories involved. Um, and so the QR code on the screen, you can actually sign up right now. I'd love to see a couple of people sign up as I'm speaking. I love that uh, when that happens. That's why the QR code is there. And um, if that happens, fantastic. But um, the different, different, different membership categories include the collection sites and the recyclers. Those are kind of core to the success. That's the infrastructure that is missing. That's the infrastructure that will make this happen. The recyclers come on board. They sign up, they go through their verification process. They're, ver they're being verified that they have a post-consumer mechanism in place. Again, th this is this is we're very focused on post-consumer recycling. Um, once they come on board, then they then they send us or their collection sites come online and they sign up to be collection sites. Those are verified that they have an association with the verified recycler. And then boom, they're up on the map and we're off and running. If you go to our current website right now, you can see the concentration of collection sites and recyclers is still in Northeast Ohio. We are hoping to expand into um, Ontario, um, other parts of Ohio in the Midwest, and then North Carolina, Maryland, um, and New England are our target markets that should hopefully unfold here over the next several months. Certainly Ohio uh, will be fully um, populated here in the next few weeks uh, with more recycling. So once the collection sites come on board, so that's part of the website, that's where people go to figure out where to recycle products. You have the general interest group, which is the media, consumers, you know, anybody that doesn't fit into these other categories. You have contractors, which includes our certified installers, new home builders, remodelers, plumbers, infrastructure, construction groups. Um, I put an arrow there for municipalities. Uh, we did have uh, Cuyahoga County, um, has been involved with us and Beth Raymar uh, is is uh, with us on our advisory board. She's been super helpful and I don't know if she's on the call today, but thanks. Thanks, Beth, for all your help along the way. Uh, we have other partnerships uh, that are nonprofit groups um, that are, you know, groups like uh, in, in uh, New England, they have the Recycling Association. We have the Construction Demolition Recycling Association. So any of the nonprofit groups that are focused on recycling, we need to partner with them. And then we have sponsorship opportunities where groups that want to contribute financially, uh, whether they be other trade associations or businesses that just have recycling as part of their mission and they're willing to contribute financially to support the organization, uh, we of course will welcome that. And then we have our own VSI member participants. So those are the membership categories. That is uh, what we're doing. And um, I'm happy to pause here now, take any questions or have a conversation um, and um, appreciate the time here today. Thank you. I'll ask you one question, sir. What's the largest impediment to the rollout of this <clears throat> process now? Um, I think the largest impediment is this collection system for post-consumer materials um, and a willingness for those at that level to become involved, you know, so whatever your, whatever, However, we define a collection site, whether it be the C&D landfill, the distributor, or local municipality, um, you know, uh, that is, you know, we, we it comes down to commitment of that component um, to tying and creating a relationship with the recycler. So the, the recyclers are willing to do it, but they they want to make sure that you know, but because they're, they're they're essentially, you know, 
taking on the most risk by you know providing a a um a bin to to whatever that just the collection site may be so you know they have to provide the bin they have to come collect the bin they, they have to be hopeful that they don't get there and there's a the couch in the bin that type of thing um and so the, you know they have designed their collection bins to be very uh, different than a dumpster uh intentionally and so so we have you know some thought that has gone into that and but it's a matter of getting commitment you know one a couple of the distributors i worked with over the year and a half you know i would keep contacting them and oh we were meaning to do this we're meaning to do that you know and so if they don't make it a priority you know it's like anything it needs to be a priority and you know is there going to be an economic incentive here to be a collection site well you know for the construction demolition landfills maybe um, if the distributors think about it more, I think it can be, you know, they're, you know, this isn't going to be like a gold mine for them, but it is going to be something that as sustainability becomes more and more important and becomes more a part of our overall way that we are capitalists, so to say, um, you know, it, it gives them an opportunity to add to their equation of that makes them a more sustainable business. Every business will approach sustainability differently. Um, certainly distributors, you know, will be different than a manufacturer will be just different than a builder. And so that's our biggest challenge is getting commitments for the, on the collection site level. Um, so that's what we learned so far. Questions. Um, is there a certain age of the, the, the siding that's, that's too old. It becomes too brittle. It's not elastic anymore. It can't be recycled. And is there a contamination that uh, you can't deal with uh, if it's been painted um, or with pipe, if it's had sewer running through it, some residuals from that? Yeah, you know, the age, it will it'll really depend on the product um, and the decision of the consumer when they want to replace it. Certainly if uh, the product, you know, some of the early generations of vinyl siding were not co-extruded they were chalking and they were really disintegrating on the wall um and so obviously that a lot of that product probably has already been replaced but a, a lot of it it's not necessarily that the product may be not fully functioning although it, it does get more brittle with time and it certainly you know is the earlier stages of it will break down more easily than the later versions of it so it comes down to well let's get you know this pro the product looks old and worn out you know we need to replace it it's more of an aesthetic in some ways um but we know that it, we know it's going on um uh, because we know uh because of the results of this program we, you know we could see like major quantities coming in through what i just described um and then so, you know some of the con the contaminations typically are what you describe for siding. I can't speak to pipe yet because we're not sure of how the post-consumer stuff will come in from pipe. But for siding, yeah, you got dirt, you got fasteners um, are the main contaminants. And so with the recycler, some of the recyclers are fairly sophisticated where they can, first off, they'll, they, you know, they can wash the product, which they do. Um, and then the second thing is they may, will have like magnets in their, process for recycling so they're they're taking out the fasteners you know because when you pull it down a lot of cases the fasteners come along with it um and so th they have been able to identify different ways to decontaminate the product to a certain extent um and then you know finally you know you don't it, you don't have to get like a perfect product to recycle it um you can have a little dirt with it maybe maybe a, a nail gets thrown through the pulverizing process and you have specks of metal that come along with it that's not going to that it we and we are working on some standards for this to you know what you know are we going to have different levels of recycled um type of recycled material you know where certain materials require a higher level of decontamination versus others uh but in general um you know you can have a little bit of contamination especially when you're using it uh that process i described earlier where you'd have product used like on the base layer of the vinyl siding whereas the cap stock that top layer that would be facing outward that's providing the protection ultraviolet need to be needs to be very specifically formulated so so there's some great steps along the way uh, that have addressed um decontamination um end of life you know really comes down in a lot of cases will come down to the consumer or you know somebody's trying to freshen up their look you know maybe the product is starting to deteriorate 
uh, to a certain extent too. I'm not saying that does not happen because that does happen, especially with the early generations of the product. But uh, a lot of it comes down to a, an aesthetic decision from the consumer. And certainly with the last few years um, uh, where people have transitioned more to being spending more time in their homes and working more from their homes, that has driven uh, you know some of the some of the want to to uh, remodel and reside their homes, get new windows. Um, hopefully that answers your question. Um, and Matt, we have a question in our chat from Jennifer Fenderbosch, who's one of our MAC members who is attending virtually today. Um, and she asked, are you working with the BIA organizations for new construction market? Yes, uh, we we have um, we have during the pilot program, we actually were working with the local home builders association. I'm, I'm assuming that that's BIA. Um, and um, we tried to do some traditional uh, advocacy for the program. And um, so we definitely have that in mind. Um, I think it's worth mentioning one of our strongest, uh, one of our most successful uh, members of the coalition, it was a remodeler um, down going towards Columbus, Columbus, uh, Dave Montante, and he's a remodeler, but he's all, he's also a collection site. So, and he has very good success with people just dropping off vinyl siding, but he collects it. Not, he doesn't have a, a he doesn't have a dumpster style collection system. It's like a rack system. So when people come in, they know to stack the product. He kind of like has conditioned the, the consumer to come in and properly stack the product, you know, because it's it's kind of intuitive how he has it set up. And he's a remodeler. And so I think that when I said collection sites can, can come in different forms, certainly the new construction side is important. And, um, and you know, there's thousands and probably millions of pounds that can be recycled um, in, in Ohio every year, uh, potentially on the new construction side. We just need to figure out what's the best model for the new construction end of it. Um, and whether that be the builders, you know, really when they have an agreement with their construction demolition landfill, they, you know, they say, hey, as part of our agreement, uh, we'd like you to do your best to recycle the product. You know, it's 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 that type of communication and collaboration um, that will help to drive the complete chain here. So we're definitely focused on, you know, what we can do better with the Home Builders Association. We didn't have a lot of success with working with them initially during the coalition because we really didn't know what the what that what that meant at that point. We're still in the learning mode, but we do intend to, uh, cr you know, continue those relationships moving along the way. So I appreciate the question and hopefully that answer gave a bit of insight as to maybe where it could go uh, on the remodeling and the new construction side. You had a question? Hi, Eric Palmer, WM. Um, just a quick question. The end user demand for this recycled product is there a limitation to the quantities that they can receive and use in their in the product that they're making? Um, ha, is there enough uh, reusable product in the market to meet that demand? Is there too much to meet that demand? So how does that math work out kind of on the, the supply and demand side? Yes. Well, it, 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 it can, as you might imagine, it can vary. Uh, Uh, yeah, there I go. Okay, hopefully I'm back. If I had a little glitch there, um, there, there, there is enough demand to take on all. In my opinion, in my view, in my opinion, to take on all the product out there that can be recycled. Now the demand. Um, will come from the recyclers and will come from the manufacturers. Um, so, so there, there is there is enough demand for this recycled product. Um, you know, right now, you know, I haven't seen anybody really incorporating more than five to ten percent of their products uh, using recycled product at this point. So, how much of the product could be recycled material? You know, we don't know that yet. And so the manufacturers and our manufacturers are fairly sophisticated when it comes to things like this. You know, they're they're kind of testing and you know figuring out what the makeup of the
I think that's officially over now. Um, I don't know if Matt's still on here or coming back. Hi, Matt, you're back, but you're on mute right now. Okay, yep, sorry about that. I'm having a little connection issue. So I'll try to I'll try to be concise in case I drop off again. The bottom line is we, we can take on as much material out there that can that we can collect on the post consumer end um, as quantities get larger. Uh, you know, we just need to be careful of what what that does to the product performance, because the last thing we want to do is, you know, all of a sudden we see an issue with recycled product being in these products. We have performance issues. So I'll 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 stop there and hopefully that answer the question as, as clearly as possible. Driving to is, is what's the delta value between virgin product and recycled product? How much of a gap there? If there's enough supply, um, do we run into the risk where there's oversupply of recycled product driving the price down, making these, these no longer affordable for folks to do the consolidation and collection? Is there any concerns with that? Or is it a large enough window between virgin product and recycled product, along with the ability to put it back into the, the reusable like model that you have here. That's all. That's really where I'm heading. I'm looking at yeah. the, uh, the business model and the dollars and cents that make sense for something to work long term like this. Um, yeah, so a year and a year and a half ago, recycled product was a lot more a lot more attractive than it is right now. But I think that it's not a big enough variation that the issue is not is is important enough that people are going to try to build in you know those variations so you know at times it works really well and at times it doesn't make sense um and so but i think you know understanding those markets um i would say that um, you know the the more product the more material at you know basic economics the more recycled material we can get into the system that's going to you know bring the cost down there's more supply so you know I, I think the more more important part of it so so the bottom line is it can work there's a variation in market like any type of material stuff building material stuff but as sustain it, it, it's more how do we tie in the carbon footprint issue how do we tie in you know that this process reduces carbon footprint how do we tie in that more and more companies are making sustainability a part of their business model so when you bring in these other components uh to it um you know that's part of the equation too and certainly that that feeds into the economic components as as sustainability becomes more a part of you know wall street and whatnot that you know th there are a lot of driving factors here and so for our industry the plaxus industry too the more that we can show how our product is actually probably more sustainable than some of the other products out there you know um you know that helps to drive demand too and the overall product. So it, ca it can work from the economic side. I would say 15, 15 years ago, we would not have enough supply to make this economically feasible from the su supply side of it. But because of what's going on, and I described earlier in my presentation, we're at a different point in time where, where that will work. Thank you for your time. I think this subject is pretty interesting, especially being that Ohio is the, the birthplace, if you will. Uh, and you guys started your pilot program here. So we may want to talk more about this uh, and, and learn more about this. I'm sure you're working with other people in Ohio. Um, and I believe the next presentation uh, has a little bit to do with the recycling supply chain and things like that, which you might you guys may be a part of, may or may not have been involved in that as well. So um, thank you for your time. And with respect to the next presenter, we'll, we're going to move on. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. And Matt, would um, I'll send you an email. Would you mind sending me your presentation so we can share it with members okay. who are not? Oh, you have it? Okay, yeah. never mind. Thank you, Matt, for your time. We really appreciate it. Sure. Um, Next on the agenda, we have Karthik Epidanula, who's with Jobs Ohio. He's going to, Karthik, did I get the pronunciation correct? Yes, you did. Um, um, with Jobs Ohio, he's going to give us a little bit of an overview about a recent report that Jobs Ohio um, completed. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, for I'll give the full report and full uh, presentation next time uh, um, in March, but uh, this is just a preview of what we have been doing. Um, just to back up, uh, my name is Karthik Avadanla. I'm the Senior Director of Advanced Manufacturing at Jobs Ohio. 
Jobs Ohio is state of Ohio's economic development organization. Um, our role is to uh, help attract uh, businesses to the state of Ohio um, so that they create jobs, hence the name Jobs Ohio. And uh, uh, we have seen uh, starting COVID, uh, uh, starting 2020, and 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 afterwards we st we started to see a little bit of an uptick in um, the activity in terms of investment uh, in recycling and sustainability related uh, industries and uh, we also saw uh, um, interest by big corporates asking us what is ohio sustainability story and uh, because of that uh, we uh, uh, engaged uh, our engaged a very uh, able team uh, with resource re recycling system. Um, Erin um, uh, here uh, represents RRS. Uh, I'm sure many of you know about uh, uh, this uh, uh, good consulting team. We engage them to try to understand what is Ohio's uh, uh, recycling infrastructure currently and uh, uh, what, where are the low hanging fruits in terms of uh, if there is anything we can do to help increase the recycling feedstock for various uh, uh, industries. So that is what we try to understand uh, through this uh, study. Uh, this study was done um, throughout 2023, and we are in the closing phases of that project where we are right now uh, scheduled to present that to our leadership. and. Uh, uh, and also some of the state leadership to try to understand uh, what their interest is, what the future steps are. And uh, once we do that with our leadership, we'll be able to uh, 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 present a full report to this group, uh, hopefully in March. Just want to stop there. Uh, um, wanted to give you a preview of what's coming for the uh, in March and uh, uh, happy to uh, answer any questions at this point. Thank you, sir. Kimberly? Um, my question maybe is for Lindsay. Um, how does your waste characterization study dovetail with this? Are you working together with Jobs Ohio? Because Lindsay, I thought I heard you say that you were also mapping landfills, transfer stations, and other assets and infrastructure. How, how will that fit? Good question. Um, we are in the process of, like you, like I said, um, trying just to map out what would be the best um, like waste flow so that we can get a best representation of what is coming through the landfill, um, so that we can utilize this information not only for the recently, you know, the traditional materials that are entering the landfill, but we are also focusing. Um, you know, heavily on organic material as that as we feel that that's the next um, piece that has not really been looked at um, as a, you know, it's been viewed as a waste material in the Swiffer um, focus is is partly organics. Um, but since we already have the funding to do, you know, we're already out there doing the legwork, we took us, you know, from my perspective of working the solid waste districts, we did per take back a step in looking at all the other materials. So hopefully that we can gain a better understanding of what is in our landfills. The last waste characterization study was done in 20 or 2003, I believe, 2003. So it's over, it's 20 years old. Um, that material is no longer like valid, kind of. We've done a lot of different things. The pandemic, there's a lot of changes. Um, so I have advocated to try to figure out how we can best get this information into, you know, those that can utilize it um, and, and move that whole arena forward. Does that make sense? But we're in the very beginning stages of how all of that's going to play out. We have to get a contractor. We have to get into the landfills. We have to get this data um, before it can actually be, you know, analyzed and looked at in a game plan and brainstorming of a game plan of how to move Ohio forward. If I may add, um... Uh, the the upcoming waste characterization isn't is anything with a study for um, Jobs Ohio. I will note that the rep, um, 
was about to say reference year, but I was like baseline. Um, it was 2021 because when we started the study, it wasn't even complete for the 22 ADR. So we did use mm -hmm. um, data from uh, the district's um, annual district reports, um, in addition to looking at um, not only the previous a waste characterization study, but also comparing it to ones that may have been in surrounding states and trying to get kind of an average to get a, a good landscape of where um, the the waste uh, characterization of, of Ohio kind of um, changed over the past decade, and there'll be more to come in March. But I just wanted to let you know if there's any um, uh, data that we presented in, in March, it's really based on, on 2021. Um, that seems kind of far away now, but at the time when you have to look at a full um, annual um, disposal and and recycling, uh, you have to make sure you have both sides of the equation. Yep. Thank you, Aiden. Chance for Karthik at this point. <clears throat> Karthik, we appreciate you giving us the overview. Um, we'll look forward to the presentation in March. So I will work with you on getting that set up when, when you're ready. Absolutely. Oh, sorry. We do have a question in the chat um, here for you. Uh, will mining gas and heavy metals from the landfills be part of the effort? Um, mining gas as in uh, methane or and heavy metals from the landfill? I, I don't believe so. So uh, this primarily was done to try to understand what the infrastructure is within the state. Um, you have to uh, understand that Jobs Ohio did not have any expertise in this area, and uh, uh, we uh, were seeing uh, companies asking us uh, uh, where the feedstock is and all of that. So as an organization that is a friend face for for the state of Ohio to try to attract businesses here. Uh, we wanted to gain that uh, uh, that uh, expertise and uh, we, we wanted to understand where the uh, 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 waste comes from, what are the waste flows and uh, what are the barriers to increasing that. So uh, it was primarily focused on uh, uh, what are the main sources of waste, paper, metal, uh, 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 glass uh, and, and such, plastic, of course, yeah. So uh, we did not look at uh, uh, any any mining gas, I believe. Erin, correct me if I'm wrong. We did not. Yeah. Thank you, Erin. We appreciate it. Um, Karthik, I'll be back in touch with you um, for the March agenda. Sure. Look forward to that. Um, next on the agenda, we have a presentation from Serva Solutions. Um, I'm not sure, Michael Schmidt, um, are you on the call? I don't think we have Serva online um, for the meeting, so <clears throat> we'll have to reach back out to them to see if we can get them on a on the future agenda, um, Serba is a battery recycler, and we've had several discussions about um, battery recycling in here, about the need for um, infrastructure and what to do with you know the issues that are cropping up. So we had Serba coming on just to give kind of an overview of their role and trying to provide a solution, and so we'll get them back on um, for a future meeting. Uh, the only other agenda item that we had was just to give a quick just you know, we've talked a couple times now about starting the state plan update. I think what Mac's recommendation at the last meeting was for us to create a subcommittee to uh, to to work on that and then to interface with all of Mac through the subcommittee. Currently, uh, in terms of Mac members, Kimberly, you had volunteered. Um, Eric Palmer, you volunteered. We have Jeff Snyder and then we have Brad Petrie and Jennifer Jones, who's with the Geauga Trumbull Solid Waste District mm -hmm. on the subcommittee as well. So I just wanted to make sure if there's any other MAC members who are interested in participating, we're happy to involve you in that. Um, not, I mean, you know, we have a subcommittee to work and we will be reporting back. What happened on the waiver process? Is anything, if that moved at all? 
Um, we were able to kick that down the road because the district that currently needed the waiver um, was able to demonstrate the percentage portion of the goal. I imagine that we're still going to have to address that. So it's still on our, our to-do list. It just didn't end up being the emergency that it was at the time. So um, we'll continue to have those discussions also. The only other thing I just wanted to throw out there is again, um, you know, we, we are happy to, oh, well, I guess we still have Brad. Brad um, it, I think you had some ideas for um, things for us to look at in terms of when we're starting this update. So if you don't mind unmuting yourself and kind of giving us just some of the ideas that you had, that would be great. Not sure that Brad's still on. Yes. Yeah. Brad might have left for lunch. That's all right. Jennifer is on though. Jennifer, do you, I'm, I'm sorry to put you on the spot. Are you willing to kind of give us any ideas that you might have about um, the subcommittee's work? Gee, nothing like uh, <laughs> springing it on me. Um, I know, I'm sorry, Jennifer. I was prepared for the other thing and then I didn't even get to contribute anything because Brad covered everything. So, um, <laughs> We can, okay, if you don't, if you're not willing, if you're not with this, about I it, can't, can push you know, it. of course, nothing, my, my brain is, is not cooperating. So, you know, I'm obviously going to be involved, but nothing's coming up to my head right this very second. So, sorry. <laughs> I apologize for putting you on the spot, Jennifer. Who's chairing the subcommittee effort? Uh, Who's, what staff is assigned to that effort? Uh, is that Brad or is that you? Uh, I, I imagine will EPA will be the ones who are who are kind of coordinating everything. Uh, uh, everybody jump in and please. <laughs> I here's I mean, here's here's the issue. Here's the issue with the state plan, Kimberly. So should we be you'll hear from from Lindsay, Sarah, or I in terms of it. The state plan, because I'm gonna be retiring. Um, I'm trying to get my hands. I'm trying to get my hands out of being the one to be in charge of it. So I'm trying to transition to other people to get them in charge of it. That's why I'm hesitating in terms of who your main contact will be. Here's the. Yeah, but. I am trying to. I am trying to be marginalized in our division, and the way I do that is pushing everything onto other people. <laughs> Interesting a career approach. Thank you. It's a strategy. I guess so. It's, it's the state by the nerd. It's the state employee exit strategy. Don't you know that? So yes, um, Kimberly, one of us will be back in touch with scheduling the first meeting. We'll probably put out a doodle poll to try to get the first date, just because it's difficult to try to yeah. coordinate. Yep. So for everybody that probably knows already, I'll say it anyways. This task is the only actually legislatively assigned task that we have as a group. It's mandated that we review it once every three years. It's time to do it again. Um, our goal before was to find consensus items that could um, positively affect the system in the best way possible. Um, the goal should be, in my opinion, the same going forward this time. Um, with a system like that, my experience has always told me it's a course correction, not necessarily a major change. Um, even though some major changes may be beneficial, major changes cause extreme conflict, especially in society today. So let's try to do something that we can accomplish a goal rather than just stare at each other and yell. So um, that's the that's the goal. Um, you know, we created this this uh, waiver process, but we never put any rubber to the road. Maybe that's one of the things that really should be figured out so that we can do it before there's an emergency. Let's do it while we have time. Um, so uh, with that, that's why we're revisiting it. It's on purpose. It's needed. Whether we do any or not, anything or not is a whole other story, but I do think that there are some um, minor cleanup issues that we can, or things that we can accomplish uh, and do some good with um, and look at some of our recycling infrastructure and maybe listening to Jobs Ohio has some direction that we can try to have the state plan assist with some of the direction that they have. I think the timing on this will work out pretty well. So, um, and, and in that vein, though, you know, um, providing you information is part of what we need to do. And so, if you know of people you would like to hear from, industries you'd like to know more about, 
Um, we're going to reach out to other states, obviously, to find out what they're doing also, but it would help us for planning and to help assist you. If if you have ideas in terms of what you'd like to know about, let us know so that we can schedule mm -hmm. people to come in and talk. That's a lot of the reason why we have the solid waste districts come in because they are most affected by the state plan um, and the implementers of the state plan. So we have to figure out how they're doing it and what needs to be adjusted going forward. That's the end of our agenda. We do have a public comment period here. So if there's any members who or anybody who is participating virtually who would like to address MAC, now is the time to to let us know that. So you can raise your hand and we'll call on you. I haven't heard anything. No. Are you thinking it said no? So with that, I think it's lunchtime. I appreciate everybody being here in person. We are a board that has to show up in person, be able to uh, do our business, uh, official business anyways, and uh, move everything forward. So looking forward to a, a 2024 that we get a couple things done and have some direction and make some rubber meet some road. And um, hopefully it'll be warmer next time we meet. <laughs> Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you to all our speakers today. Do we need a motion to adjourn? Yes. Need a motion to adjourn. To adjourn. Second. Second. All in favor? Uh, Nobody gets to listen if we don't want to go. Seconded. Alex. Bernie. <laughs> <laughs> we shouldn't sit next to each other.